Okay, good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Professor Salman, for uh, inviting me here to this uh, boot camp. And I believe we had very good sessions uh, last few days also. I'm sorry I missed the boat trip, but I can get seasick at times. So, so, um, so we're going to talk about neurotrauma guidelines in Pakistan. Um, uh, first of all, I must uh, confess that uh, neither Pakistan nor most of the uh, lower and middle income countries have any guidelines on neurotrauma, um, unfortunately. The, the guidelines uh, mean that setting the minimal standards of care from the accident site, we have to agree on minimal standards, core guidelines, and then a system of care which grows as trained personnel and resources become available. Um, we have the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, which are evidence-based. Um, these are being followed in nearly all the high income countries. Uh, and uh, there are many reasons why they cannot be really brought into play in uh, lower and middle income countries like Pakistan. You know the general measures, of course, um, and the first line of therapy then is CSF drainage and hypocapnia, mannitol and 3% saline. And then the second tier is high dose barbiturates, intense hypoventilation, increase in mean arterial pressure and mild to moderate hypothermia and then leading to decompressive craniectomies. And you can see that these are all evidence-based and uh, you can see that biofrontal decompression is not recommended to improve the outcome, but it is demonstrated to reduce the ICP and to minimize the stay in ICU. And also it is recommended that the craniotomy, the decompressive craniotomy should be not less than 12 by 15 centimeters or 15 centimeters in diameter. Now this is very, very important because we have seen uh, many people doing decompressive craniotomies, uh, small ones, and those can make things worse because then the brain is going to herniate out and damage it further. Also then again, the level 2B recommendations for ICP monitoring, it is to reduce the in-hospital and 2 week post-injury mortality. ICP monitoring should be done a GCS 3 to 8 after resuscitation and an abnormal CT. Or if the CT is normal, um, then two out of three is either the age should be greater than 40 years, unilateral or bilateral motor posturing, or the blood pressure uh, should be less than 90. Uh, so here I must add that uh, one of the reasons that we are not following the protocols is that very few centers in Pakistan, and again, very few centers in LMICs are doing ICP monitoring. So uh, most of the guidelines are based on the ICP monitoring and, and uh, uh, progressing according to that. Um, also, the cerebral perfusion pressure is to decrease the two weeks mortality. And then level three guidelines on advanced cerebral monitoring, jugular bulb monitoring, it reduces mortality and improves outcome at three to six month post injury. Now, we know that most of the uh, neuro uh, trauma cases um, are 74% of surgeries for TBI are needed in LMICs. And this is from Key Park and submitted has been public, uh, published now. And 89% of surgeries for traumatic spine injuries occur in lower and middle income countries. And yet we do not have any guidelines. Now the guidelines need to look at the local resources, the profile of the injury, the local data, geography, transport difficulties and resources of personnel and equipment. I tried in 1998, I think it was, presented the guideline which we had developed uh, for the Pakistan Society of Neurosurgeons, but unfortunately there were no takers at that time, really. Uh, if you look at the guidelines, it should be a holistic approach going from prevention, pre-hospital care, ICU theater, and rehabilitation. Um, so I'm going to take you through how uh, we have looked at these guidelines and what we have tried to do and what we are following now, at least in our hospital. We did a neuro trauma survey uh, from Indonesia, Pakistan, and India, uh, and uh, it was a snapshot survey of the Asian Australasian Society of Neurosurgeons, and it showed uh, the differences between high-income countries and uh, us, that 63% uh, of patients were not wearing any helmets, and seat belts uh, were 60% uh, were not wearing any seat belts. So we started from prevention uh, in, in, in that center and, and we looked at and we did um, uh, seminars for people uh, showing these kind of pictures to everybody. Um, seminars and we did poster exhibitions and uh, 
we, the Neurotrauma Committee of the World Federation, uh, got together with Think First International, and uh, we started seminars, and we did one for public uh, last November in Peshawar. Then we looked at, in this survey, we looked at um, who provided the emergency treatment at the scene of injury, and it was the bystanders, the lay people who were providing the first aid to the patients. Um, and then we looked at if a nurse or doctor accompanied the patient in the ambulance. No, there was no, nobody there. Uh, in fact, our ambulances, most of the ambulances do not have any oxygen or suction uh, facilities even available in the ambulance. Um, and we know it's very important that 50% uh, of patients who die from TBI do so within the two hours of injury, and 40% of pre-hospital deaths potentially are preventable uh, if you have proper pre-hospital care. If you look at the uh, rates of pre-hospital deaths, it's 59% of trauma deaths in high-income countries, with 72% in middle-income countries. And 81% in low income environment. Um, they did a study in Kenya and they showed that only 52% of patients arrived at the hospital within 30 minutes after road traffic accident and only 72% within one hour. Uh, so, uh, and we looked at our own statistics uh, because of the long distances traveled, uh, majority of the patients were operated uh, within uh, more than 24 hours. It was not that there was a delay uh, in hospital, it was a delay of the patients being transferred from different areas, especially from Afghanistan and other places to, to Peshawar in our place. So looking at the management, the treatment is geared towards prevention of secondary injuries and rehabilitation. Secondary injuries like hypoxia, hypotension, edema, raised endocrine pressure lead to increased mortality, we all know that. And the longer the delay, greater the mortality. So the pre-hospital care, is the most important, one of the most important factors really. You might have high-end ICUs, et cetera, but if, if your patient is not going to arrive to you, you can't do really very much about that. <clears throat> the in-hospital management uh, is guided by GCS monitoring, CT scan, ICP monitoring, pupillary response, and the goal is supportive treatment and prevention of secondary damage. So now I'll take you to how we uh, looked at how to uh, develop guidelines for ourselves in hospital guidelines I'm talking about. So majority of, we know that severe traumatic brain injuries globally are managed without ICP monitoring. No recent literature to guide management in non-monitored patients. Large part of literature comes from well-equipped larger centers in high income countries and no resource-based guidelines in LMIC to guide TBI. So we looked at resource-based the Neurotrauma Committee of the WFN has uh, formed a small group to look at, to develop stratified guidelines uh, to, to, to take them right from the lower level of hospitals to the higher level of hospitals in each country. You have very good hospitals here like Liaquat National or Khan, but then there are centers which have uh, nothing available to them. So we need to develop stratified guidelines for that. And this position paper, uh, and, and we recommended, asked Andres Rubiano from Colombia, to do this study and they developed uh, these uh, guidelines uh, and they have been uh, uh, accepted for Journal of Neuroscience and Neural Practice uh, and hopefully they'll be published uh, this month. So please you must have a look at that because those are something which should be recommended for uh, lower and middle income countries. And this is a pre-hospital emergency department surgery intensive care beyond one option for treatment of TBI, a stratified protocol bootstrap. And we wrote a, uh, a, a commentary on that paradigm shift from standard driven protocols to resource driven guidelines for neurotrauma management in low and middle income countries. So this is the, this is the difference uh, between the, 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 the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines and the guidelines set um, in for, for low and middle income countries. You all must have heard of the best trip trial in 2012, uh, which provided the only tested non-ICP monitoring treatment by uh, Randy Chestnut. Um, there was a lot of criticism there, uh, but uh, they, they found that there was no evidence of outcome difference for monitored and non-monitored patients. And this trial compared ICP monitored patients versus non-monitored patients with imaging and clinical examination protocol. So these are the guidelines we have been trying to follow for the last many months. Um, and this is a consensus-based management protocol for the treatment of severe traumatic brain injury based on imaging and clinical examination for use when ICP monitoring is not employed. 
So you all can have a look at that because this is something which is very important as most of us are not practicing uh, ICP monitoring. We are doing it in our hospital, uh, but not with every patient that we're doing intraventricular uh, uh, monitoring. So the consensus revised ICE protocol, the CREVICE protocol, it's not a substitute, but a supplement for empirical evidence, effort to provide for the vacuum left by absence of evidence-based guidelines and developed using the Delphi technique, uh, which involved 43 intensivist and neurosurgeons. So this was all the work of the uh, Professor Randy Chester's group, uh, and, and they tested them in, in uh, South America, in Bolivia and some other countries. And they came up with this protocol, um, which he had shown us last November when he was here in Peshawar, and, and he, we, we tried to adopt that. So the management protocol depends on the Marshall score on the CT scan, interval CT scans, clinical score, Glasgow coma score, neuro worsening, people response. So it's a four tiered management response. I'm sure you all have studied the Marshall uh, grading, which uh, uh, looks at the cisterns, the midline shift, the mass lesion, and then divides it into different levels of injury of the brain. <clears throat> so intracranial hypertension is suspected and treatment is recommended in the presence of one major or two minor criteria. And these are the major criteria where compressed systems with using the Marshall uh, diffuse injury three, midline shift of greater than five millimeter, non-evacuated mass lesion, and the minor criteria are GCS motor score of four or less, pupillary asymmetry, abnormal pupillary activity. So CT classification of Marshall diffuse injury two with basal systems are present with midline shift or high or mixed density lesion of 25 centimeters or less. And neuro worsening is defined as decrease in the motor GCS of one or more points, new loss of pupil reactivity, internal development of pupil symmetry, asymmetry of two greater than two millimeter or bilateral midriasis, new focal motor deficit, and herniation syndrome, the Cushing triad. And how do we do the imaging schedule? Uh, initial imaging, then repeat, uh, that's initial CT scan, then repeat at greater than 12 hours. If initial, then at less than four hours, then at 24 hours, 48 hours, and as when required. So the tier one therapy is scheduled hypertonic saline, for example, four hourly, scheduled mannitol, for example, four hourly, which we are doing routinely now also, but without really planning it, how we should do it, and uh, have normotheria, Thermia threshold of 37.5. Tier two is hyperventilation, hypertonic saline by continuous infusion and increase in sedation. And tier three is decompressive cranectomy, high dose IV barbiturates, hypothermia. Tier four is untested protocols like namadapine and magnesium. So when do we escalate the uh, tier therapy? Why, when do we go from one to two? So escalation therapy or adding another treatment should be considered for the following, uh, if there's neuro worsening, and if there's no improvement or worsening on follow-up CT imaging, and if there's no acceptable response to the initial therapy. So if you look at this, uh, it's, it's, it's a very uh, difficult sign maybe to understand, but if you sus sus suspect high ICP, then you, Intubate, ventilate, and initiate tier one. And if it's zero worsening, you initiate tier two and four on four fourth. And then what about weaning protocol? So to, for the weaning protocol, it's again important to look at the Marshall uh, CT score, to look at the GCS, and to look at uh, uh, the, the neuro worsening. So this is a support matrix. Uh, this is what we follow. Uh, so, so we've got the Marshall score, the pupils, and the motor response. So the, the green is that you can wean off without any problem. The yellow is that you proceed with caution. And the red is that do not wean. So you can see that in the first 24 hours, it's all caution. Then after 48 hours, uh, you can wean off in some instances. And if you look at then 72 hours and after 72 hours, there are more chances of uh, weaning off uh, depending on the motor score, et cetera. So, I think you need to look at this. Uh, this is my suggestion to see whether you can follow this. And I think this is somewhat structured compared to what we are doing now, totally unstructured, really. Um, also, when the, the paper comes out on the stratified guidelines from Columbia, I think that'd be something to look at as well for us. 
Rehabilitation is one of the most important parts, which is often neglected. Uh, it has to be multidisciplinary and a uh, question role of DBA. Uh, the AANS survey again looked at this and we found that majority of the patients were uh, sent home uh, without any rehab. And if you know a study between the United States and India, the initial outcome score was similar without ICP monitoring and with ICP monitoring. But in six month uh, score, uh, outcome score, in India was much lower because of poor rehabilitation. Um, and Shahzad Shamim is sitting here, they, I think you wrote a paper on uh, training the relatives uh, to go home and, uh, and, and give rehab to the patients. Now, <clears throat> guidelines uh, or recommendations for head in, in spine injury care in LMIC, these were the Peshawar recommendations which were launched in November uh, last year. And these are the policy recommendations for the government policymakers. And this came from the global neurosurgery thing that in addition to doing neurosurgery better, how to better deliver neurosurgical care to all who need it. Uh, this was a consensus meeting uh, on decompressive craniectomies few years back. You know that the WFNS had launched the Global Neurosurgery Committee recently, um, and, and they are looking at to achieve universal access to neurosurgical care, to align and coordinate all global neurosurgery activities, to stimulate and facilitate relevant research to inform policy, to engage with stakeholders for building integrated surgical systems, to co-educate for investing in surgical care for all with universal health coverage by 2030. So these policy recommendations for the government are so that we can reach the universal health coverage by 2030, uh, so that 80% of the world is within four hours of a neurosurgical center by 2030. And the timelines are, are given like this. We hope that we can achieve something in Bogota in the WS meeting in 2021. What in Pakistan we have tried to do is that um, since we launched the National Vision for Surgical Care 2025 um, in the Provincial Engagement Workshop in Khaybar Pukhtunkhwa in Peshawar, which we hosted, we were able to piggyback some of the suggestions of the policy recommendations onto the National Vision for Healthcare. So we hope that maybe they can uh, input that in there. Uh, and the most important thing is how are we going to increase the numbers? And there's a lot of discussion on that, whether we need to train general surgeons or we need to be able to train more neurosurgeons or how are we going to do that? This is a, a problem which has been discussed uh, many, many times. And you know that in Australia and even in Northern Ireland, I don't know if we're still doing that, they should train the general surgeons for six months so that they could do bar holes uh, uh, remotely. Um, I would like to invite you to the sixth International Neurosurgery Resident Course which is going to be held in Peshawar from 3rd to 6th, March 2021, um, uh, to all the faculty and the young residents as well. I think it will be a good course. Thank you very much. Thank you.